So let's go through the practice problems for the branch prediction. So first part is the review. Go ahead and here are your two questions. So pause the video, answer the questions first on your own, then discuss them with your partner. All right, so the first question, why did we decide to predict the future for branches and not other hazards? Remember, we had a bunch of other hazards and it's only these ones that we decided to predict things for. So the data hazards we had, well, we had the data. It was just in the wrong place. So we didn't need to predict anything. We just needed to forward it. For the structural hazards, we were using the logic for something else. We didn't need to predict it. We just needed to make more logic and then we could do the two things at the same time. But for the control hazards, the problem was we couldn't get the answers early enough. We needed them early in the pipeline. It would take longer to compute them. So building more logic didn't help us because we had to wait and they weren't somewhere else. We had to wait. So the only other choice was to predict them. And we saw that waiting hurts performance. We saw these branch delay slots in the stall. And if we can guess, then if we guess correctly, we save performance. So guessing correctly is all the really important part here because if you guess incorrectly, you then put a bunch of instructions out there which you have to squash. And not only does that hurt performance, but it also uses up a lot of energy. Okay, so could we use prediction to help with any other hazard we saw? Well, here's another example where we had to put in a bubble. Remember when we're loading something from the memory, we had to wait an extra cycle before we could use it because we only get the data out at the end of the memory stage. So loads are an exa are example of this. Here we have to wait. We can't use extra hardware to get it earlier and the data isn't somewhere else. So we can't just forward it, we have to wait. So this is similar here. So what we did is we waited it, but could we guess and predict the value? So can we say, gee, the load's gonna take a while to get there. So let's go ahead and guess what the value of the load is gonna be and start working on that. Well, the answer is yes, we can do this, but not as easily. And so to think, think about is why would it be harder to predict the value of a load than to predict the value of a branch? So think about how many possible values there are for a branch. Well, there are two, taken and not taken, and they usually have a really good pattern, but data doesn't really have that. So there are lots of values you can have when you load a 32-bit value from data, and it doesn't have lots of patterns. So it's a lot harder to predict this. Now, this doesn't mean people haven't tried. And in fact, about a third of all the values in your memory are zeros. So if you predict zero, you're actually doing pretty well. Okay, now we're gonna go and take a look at the effects of branch predictors. So we've got here is a history. This is what actually happens and two different types of predictors and we start in a particular state. So here we're gonna start predicted not taken. And so the question is if we predict not taken and our previous one is so we predict not taken and we have a not taken branch, what's our next state gonna be? What are we gonna predict next time? And then what's gonna happen as you go through these branches, how many are you gonna get correct? So go ahead for the one bit and the two bit one, go ahead and pause the video, answer the question together with your partner. Okay, so let's take a look at this here. So here are our taken branches in these patterns. And so this one has one taken in the middle and this one alternates between taken and not taken. So what's gonna happen here? Well, we've got not taken and we, our prediction's not taken, we have not taken. So our next state's gonna be zero. We're gonna predict not taken. And that's great because the next time we also have not taken. So we get it correct. And we get it correct all the way up until this point here. So at this point here, our, pre our state is zero. So we predict not taken, but the branch was taken. So we got it wrong here. But now we're gonna change our prediction to taken. So in the next one, we're gonna go ahead and predict taken, even though it was actually not taken. So we're gonna have two errors here. We're gonna make an error the first time we switch to taken and the second time when we switch back to not taken. Now, if we go ahead and use the two-bit branch predictor, we're gonna start in strongly not taken. And then when we see this taken branch here, we're gonna to switch to weakly not taken, but we're still gonna predict not taken. So we'll make a mistake here. But then when we go back the next time, we won't make a mistake. So this one, we're actually have higher accuracy because we only make a mistake once as opposed to switching and continuing to make a mistake. Now let's take a look at the alternating pattern over here. So this is the worst possible case. Every time we see the opposite one and we switch our prediction, so we're wrong for the next one. So here we're wrong for every single one of them. So the only time we get it right is the first time because we got lucky with what our default prediction was. The two-bit predictor does a lot better here. It now goes between strongly not taken and weakly not taken, but it never predicts taken. So we're wrong for all the taken branches, but we get all the not taken branches, right? So we do a lot better on this one. Okay, now we're gonna take a look at some loops and we're gonna compare three predictors here, the backwards taken, forward not taken, a one bit predictor and a two bit predictor. So what you're supposed to do is take a look at this loop and figure out the number of mispredictions and what they'll be in terms of percentages. 
So pause the video and answer the question together with your partner. Okay. So if we look at these loops here for backwards taken, forward not taken, this is gonna be right every time we go backwards, except for the last time. And we go through our loop 100 million times, so we're gonna be wrong one out of 100 million times. So that's essentially 0%. The one bit predictor, the first time through the loop, it's gonna predict it's not taken, so that you end the loop, but you're gonna go on. And then the last time, it's also gonna get it wrong. So we'll have two incorrect predictions out of 100 million. So two out of 100 million is also about 0%. For the two-bit predictor, we're gonna be wrong the first two times and the last time. So we start out as strongly not taken. The first time we go through the loop, we do take the branch. And the second time we take it. So we'll mispredict it twice. And then at the end, we'll mispredict it a third time. So three out of 100 million times wrong, which is still 0% since it's 100 million. Okay, now we have some more complicated code here. So here we have two loops. We have an outer loop J and an inner loop K. And each one has its own history. So go through this and figure out what's gonna happen for each of these two loops and what the total mispredictions are going to be. So pause the video, answer the question together with your partner. Okay, so if we take a look at this, we have a total of 100 million times 10 or a billion branches in the inner loop. So the outer loop's 100 million times. So we do this one 100 million times and this one goes through it 10 times each. So that's a billion times we go through this one here. So let's take a look at this. So for backwards taken, forward not taken, the K loop is wrong every last time and the J loop is wrong the last time. So what does that mean? Well, the inner loop is, goes 100 million times. So that's 100 million times we're wrong here plus one time wrong here. So that's 1.1, 1 .1, oh, sorry, 100 million plus one over a total of 1.1 billion predicted branches. So 9% wrong. For the one bit one, we have the same as we had before. We're gonna be wrong first time and the last time for this. So that's two times wrong each time through here and two times for the outer. So now that's two times 100 million. Because remember we do this loop inside 100 million times over 1.1 billion or 18%. And for the two bit one, we're gonna be wrong the very first two times of this loop. And then we're gonna be wrong one time afterwards. So when we go through the loop the first time, we're wrong the first two times, we're wrong at the end. But when we come out of the loop, it leaves it in the weekly, not ta weekly taken state. So the next time we'll get it right. So, and then for the J loop, it'll be the same. So here we have, you know, one times hundred million in here, plus the first two in the wrong, plus three on the outside. So plus five, so 9% here. And the key thing to remember is this predictor over here is able to remember that this loop is usually taken. So the next time you go into the loop, it doesn't start off having switched the way this one does here. Okay, now go through and calculate the penalty for misprediction. And so we're gonna do it for two predictors here, an always taken predictor and a good two bit predictor. So go ahead, pause the video and answer the question together with your partner. All right, so how do we do this? So we're looking for the CPI slowdown. That's the cycles per se instruction slowdown for this processor, which has 17 cycle misprediction penalty. It means each time we get it wrong, it costs us 17 cycles. And we do one cycle per instruction. We have two predictors. And over here, I've got a table which shows you two predictors for all these predictors, how accurate they are. That means how many times they write and for a bunch of applications, how many branches they have. So now we can compute this. So we're gonna look first at the always taken predictor and we're gonna see that it's right about 60% of the time. So how do we use this? Well, we've got always taken. So we know how many branches we have. 11% branches for this program times 40% 40, 40 misprediction. So 60% of the time we're right. So 40% of the time we're wrong times 17 cycles for misprediction. So this over here, this is how often it hurts. This is how many times we make a wrong prediction. And this over here is how much it hurts. Each time we make a misprediction, it's gonna cost us 17 cycles. And then this last part over here is what it costs normally. So you add that up and you see we're gonna have an average of 1.8 cycles per instruction. So we're 1.8 times slower than if we did perfect prediction. Now let's take a look at a good two-bit predictor. So we can go up to the good two-bit predictor here. We can read off its value. And here we see we have the same percentage of branches, but this time it hurts much less frequently, same amount each time. And so now we're going 1.2 times slower. So there's a big difference having a more accurate branch predictor. And for reference here, a processor that's about 15 years old will get about 98% correct here versus these. Processors today are incredibly accurate branch predictors. Okay, so now I want you to go through and I want you to figure out what are the inputs and outputs to a branch predictor that has a branch target buffer in it. So think about what's going in and out of the branch predictor. So go ahead, pause the video, answer this question together with your partner.
OK, so let's take a look. So I'm going to start with the outputs. What comes out of a branch predictor? Well, we need the prediction. Are we predicting the branch is taken or not taken? We need whether it's valid. That is, is it an actual valid prediction. So do we know something about it? And the target, where should we go to? So if we have this information, we know what to do when we get a branch prediction. What do we need for the input? Well, in order to make a prediction, we need the PC. We need the instruction that's the branch so that we can know what to predict for that branch. But we need a few more inputs too. So given this input, piece, input PC, we're going to predict what happens next. But we also need to learn what happens. So when we get the result of the branch, we need to update it. So we're going to get what actually happened. Was the branch actually taken or not taken? What the actual target for the branch is? And using these, we can then go ahead and update our branch predictor. And of course, we need the update PC, my apologies, so that we know which one of these PCs we should store this for. OK, so let's take a look at what happens inside. Here's our branch predictor. It has a table. It has all the PCs we're looking at. It has whether what their state is, whether it's valid, and where you're going. So a branch PC comes in. We look in the table. It says, aha, I found that PC here. The history is going to tell me, was it taken or not taken? If it's valid, it's going to tell me if I should trust this, and the target is where to go. Then once we've got the results, we then go and take that information, we update these. So we update the history, if it's taken or not taken, and the target where the branch is going. OK, let's take a look at how we hook up the branch predictor in the pipeline itself. So go ahead and answer these questions together with your partner. OK, so the first question here, in which pipeline stage do we predict? Well, we've talked about this a lot. We need to predict in the instruction fetch stage because we have to predict before we access the instruction memory. We need the PC so we know which instruction to load. What inputs does the branch predictor need? Well, it needs the PC. We need to say, hey, this is the current instruction. Now go predict where the branch is going to go. Where does the branch predictor's output go? Well, we're going to have to have the prediction go to choose the next PC. So we have to say, OK, we had a branch. What's the next PC we choose? And in which pipeline stage do we update? Oh, sorry, we need the next PC. We're going to update the results in memory when we know the result. So when we finally calculated what happens in the branch, then we go and update it. And what do we need there? Well, we need the branch result. We need the PC of the branch to update. And we need the target. So we need information from here so we can update our table. OK, let's take a look at connecting this up. So we're going to take our current PC and we're going to say, OK, if this is a branch, let's make a prediction for what the next PC is going to be. We're going to get our branch target out. And that's going to be going in as our PC after this. So the next PC we're going to predict. So here comes our target. So this is where we're predicting will go. And then we're going to use the predicted taken or not taken in the valid to say, should we use this value? So you notice what's happening over here. Instead of choosing from the branch or from the PC plus 4 for our next PC, we're now choosing from the branch, the PC plus 4, or our prediction if we have a predicted value. Now we know the results over here at the memory stage when we're all done. So from this point, we're going to take our logic here, which says, was it taken? We're going to use that to update. And we're going to have what is the, uh, sorry, we're going to update what it's taken and the target. What is the calculated address for the branch that comes out of the adder where we calculated our address? But we also need to know what PC it is. So to know what PC we need to update here, we need to store the PC of the branch all through here so that we can say, ah, this is the branch I want to update. When we have that, we can then send that PC around to update the branch predictor. So here are some instructions, and we can see what happens when we execute them. So we execute the first instruction, which is a branch instruction. So the branch instruction is going to go into the predictor, and it's going to make a prediction for what's the next one. So it's going to say, hey, it's a valid branch. So it's going to predict the next instruction is here, the one right after. It's predicting it's not taken. So we go to the next one. Then on the next cycle, we go ahead and put that in here. We put this into our branch predictor. It's not a branch. So it says it's not valid. So we just do PC plus 4. And we keep going through that. Here's another one. It's not a branch. So PC plus 4. And we keep going until the instruction gets through. Then when the instruction finally gets to the memory stage, we can go ahead and update it here. So now here we have the result of the branch. And we can go and update our table saying, now we know what's happening with that branch. All right, so here's a puzzle with branch predictors. So we have two different branch predictors. And as you can see here, they handle different codes differently. Some are accurate, more accurate, and sometimes than other times. So go ahead, pause the video, and answer the question together with your partner. OK, so if we could do the, put the two predictors together, we could do a really good job. We get better accuracy overall. How can we do that? Well, sometimes predictor A is right, and sometimes predictor B right. And we want a mux to choose between them. But how do we know which predictor we should choose? Well, we have to predict that. So why don't we have another predictor that predicts which predictor we should use? So it's a predictor predictor. If we do this, we have what's known as a hybrid or tournament predictor, saying we've got a bunch of different things that can make predictions. And let's try and guess which is the best one. And this is a very common way of doing branch prediction these days. 
Okay, here's a question about filling branch delay slots. So we've got some code here and you can see what the code does. So go ahead and get started, walk through the code and make sure you understand what it does and how it works. So pause the video, figure this out with your partner and then we'll go through it together. Okay, so if we take a look at what's happening here, we have some special values. So this is our loop bounds that we're loading and this tells us we're gonna go through 10 values in the data here. And we have this special value and it says that we're gonna do something whenever we find the special value there. And if you look at what the code does, it loads the value, it checks if it's special. If it is special, it jumps down here and does subtraction and then continues the loop, goes on to the next one until the end and repeats. If it's not special, it does something different. It sums the data here and then it jumps to the end and continues. Okay, so now let's figure out what percentage of the operations are no-ops. So take a look at how this code is executing. We can see where the no-ops are and figure out how many of them are gonna be no-ops when we actually execute the code with this data. Go ahead and solve this together with your partner. Okay, so let's take a look at this. So the loop repeats 10 times and it hits special values two times. So each time we hit a special value, we go through here, we do the, the check for special, we hit this no-op, we jump down to here, and then we hit this no-op. So we've got two no-ops each time it's special. Now, if we have a regular value, we're gonna have three no-ops because we'll go to this branch, and we'll go through it, then we'll go to the continue and we'll go through it and then we'll get to the last one. So we'll have three of them. So if we look at this, we have eight times we get three no-ops and two times we get two no-ops. That's 28 times going through the branch. Plus we have five instructions at the beginning. So that's a total of 101 instructions or 28% of the time we're doing no-ops. Now, question is, can you change the code to fill the delay slots to reduce this number? So see if you can go ahead and do that. All right, so let's take a look at what we could do here. So what if we took this add it here for the next address and we moved it up to the beginning here? So this executes every time we go through the loop. So if we put it up here in place of this no-op, it'll happen every time and that'll save us a no-op. So we can go ahead and do that. But now what we really like to do is we'd like to move this loop incrementing out of the loop here. So could we move this one afterwards down here? Well, no, we can't because this depends on it. We need these R2s here, so we can't move that down there. So that's annoying. But what if we did it the other way around? What if we took the loop counter and we move that up here? Now we can go ahead and move the other one. So now we can take that other one and move it down to the end here because this one doesn't depend on the branch. Okay, so we can move those around and it mattered what order we did them on. But what can we put in here into this no-op? Well, we can take this add up here and we can move it down to the no-op because this happens every time we go through this part of the code anyways. So we might as well go ahead and put it down there. So here's the code that we have now. So if we do this, we now have no op, no ops of special, no ops if we're special, so zero no ops altogether. So now it takes us 73 instructions total, none of them are no ops, and we've gone down from 101 cycles to 73 cycles, so we're 27% faster by being clever about where we put things in the no op spaces. Okay, are there any missing no ops here? So the answer is yes, we did miss something. We missed something between the load word so we need to be careful here, the load word, because we need a cycle between we can use that. So we actually need a no-op in here if we're gonna do this correctly. All right, two extra problems. Pause the video, try and answer them first on your own, then discuss it with your partner. So let's go through these two. So what's the problem with predictors? Well, the problem is you have to clean up if you make mistakes. So you gotta be really accurate because otherwise it costs you a lot each time you're wrong. Another question here, if we add a branch target buffer to the branch predictor, do we still need to calculate the branch address? And the answer is, yeah, we still need to calculate it every time, even if the predictor is right, because we need to make sure that we jump to the right place. So we still have to do the calculation. We just get to do it. We, the predictor just gives us the results earlier. Okay, so go ahead through the reflections, pause the video, answer the questions on your own. All right, and now for the last part, go ahead and swap your answers to your partner help your partner out, identify ways that they could work on the material, and then you're all set. Thanks.